Dr. Coley. Take it away. Thank you, Tom, and good morning, everyone. I'm truly delighted to be a part of this panel and, and share the stage with some uh, amazing individuals. So thank you uh, for having me this morning. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about me. I've be, just been very privileged to have had an opportunity to work with some impactful initiatives with some leading organizations globally, with some amazing people and teams. And like all of us on the call, I share a passion for making healthcare better. And I'm currently serving as a senior advisor with the Albright Stonebridge Group. And I'm also leading uh, the Global Health uh, Initiative for Wings of Hope, a NGO based in the US and works globally. Next slide, please. So let me begin by sharing a personal story. Um, as a bright-eyed first-year medical student, I had a wonderful opportunity to spend my first um, uh, Christmas as a medical student uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And we were to serve, serve a village of Guatemalan refugees. Um, and our mission was to really bring health and healing to this displaced community. And what I realized was that despite all our good intentions and the good work that we did, the interventions we did were self-limited and we did little to give the community health and healing beyond that two week period we were there. There was clearly an unmet need and an opportunity that could truly create something that would be empowering, sustainable and scalable. Next, click please. So perhaps the most impactful thing we did in that mission, despite all the good work in, during the two weeks was leave this book with the villagers where there's no doctor the Spanish version of it. And as I was leaving uh, that, um, that trip, and as I've thought about what we did that period of time, that thought of sustainability and leaving something behind has stayed with me uh, through all the years. And I'll come back to this a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide, please. As I have engaged uh, in work globally, um, and all of you will probably appreciate that, we recognize that there are five common challenges that every economy, every country is facing. Safety and quality in care, access to timely care, the cost of care, workforce issues, maldistribution, inadequate resources, and the likes, and now recently burnout. And then ultimately the, the patient or the family or the consumer experience uh, as a result of healthcare. Next slide, please. So when we look at safety, clearly we have a lot of work to do. We have data from the WHO, from Johns Hopkins, from other sources, which clearly points that we are not performing well. One in 10 admissions leads to an adverse event globally. One in 300 admissions leads to death. 43 million people are injured worldwide due to unsafe medical care. And we really must address this. Next slide, please. Access to time in appropriate care. These are some pictures from a village mission in Colombia where patients have access to care perhaps once a month and they line up to see the doctors and the teams when they come in. Uh, we have similar stories we have seen in India and other geographies where there's such a dire need that we can we can create a paradigm which can allow us to serve these patients much better in a much more equitable fashion. Next slide, please. We also have the same condition in developed countries. This is data from the US. We leave about 9% of our population uninsured. And data shows that uninsured adults are much more likely to go without needed medical care due to cost. So the access issue comes in multiple variety. But fundamentally, the challenge we have globally is that our patients are not getting the care they need when they need it. Imagine going to a restaurant and ordering a meal and you're told that you have to come back a week later to get the meal. We would never go back to a restaurant. So, so really, access to care becomes a very important uh, uh, intervention point. Next slide, please. And all of this at a cost of about 10% of the global GDP. So our bill for healthcare globally is about $8 trillion. 
And studies have shown that spending more doesn't necessarily lead you to better care. As you can see, the United States is a clear outlier. And as we'll see in the upcoming slides, we definitely have opportunities in the US healthcare system uh, to do better, despite all the money that's being spent here. Next slide, please. So when we look at life expectancy, when you compare the US to other similar countries, we have the lowest life expectancy. Child mortality is higher in the US than some of its peers. Next slide, please. And when we look at response to COVID, spending more doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually doing impactful things when it matters. When you look at this slide, it, the y-axis actually look, looks at the confirmed deaths per million people as of August 30th. And then the, the x-axis is actually the economic impact of economic policies and impact on economies. And you see that some of the countries that have been leaders, both in terms of mortality and economic uh, impact, uh, are nece not necessarily the most expensive countries in the world. Uh, Japan, Taiwan, Indonesia, Nigeria have been standouts uh, in terms of containing mortality as well as uh, uh, impact on the economy. Next slide, please. And when we start looking at workforce pictures, uh, the story is, is pretty clear. Now, I love the story on uh, the, the, the cartoon on the left side. It was drawn by a seven-year-old patient, a depiction of an office visit. And there's one thing that's wrong with this picture. That is that the doctor is smiling. And, and really, you know, when you, when you look at the experience that all the technology has created for consumers and patients in the US and other developed countries, there's a lot of opportunity we see in terms of bringing the joy of medicine for physician and bringing that patient experience back at the point of care. Similarly, this is a picture from India where you have a number of patients lining up to see one doctor. So these factors amongst others are leading to an increased rate of burnout. Next slide, please. So we have data that shows that, uh, that physicians and nurses in, in some settings are working at about 50% productivity. So if we were to look at healthcare like a business, how do you begin to run a business at 50% productivity of your highest paid employee? And then data shows that about 30% of the resources in healthcare are really not aligned to those five axes that I spoke about earlier. So if 30% of 8 trillion could be repurposed to something that actually gives us better care safer care, timely care, cheaper care, that is the opportunity that I think this moment is presents in front of us. And ultimately, we all know that the pot of money is not grow going to grow significantly. Health ecosystems globally need to learn to do more with less. Next slide. Next. So the question I ask is, is there a more sustain sustainable way to deliver care? And, and as we look at how other industries have changed how they run business, the answer is quite clear. Technology has matured to a level where I think we can come up with some very creative and novel solutions. And hence our discussion today on telehealth, remote patient monitoring. Now, food for thought in low and middle income countries where there's still an undercapacity of hospital beds and the primary care networks perhaps are not very mature, and the marginalized population essentially have access to no care, should we be talking about building an ecosystem that talks just about hospital beds? Or should we be talking about an ecosystem that incorporates virtual care, remote patient monitoring, artificial intelligence capabilities, along with you know, the traditional uh, spheres of care? Next slide, please. So let's look at some data, what's happening. As we look at data, you know, for the last 20 plus years, the number of hospital beds per, inhab per 1,000 inhabitants globally is decreasing. Next slide. But we're also seeing data, at least from the West, is that we are taking care of more patients with preventable diseases uh, in the hospital setting. Next slide, please. And even though the number of beds is decreasing, the cost of care in the hospitals has skyrocketed. 
In the US, the cost of hospital care has increased three and a half times almost, from 1.7% of, of the GDP in 1960s to almost 5.8% of the GDP uh, currently. Next slide, please. And that is pretty unsustainable. When you break down the hospital expenditures, a third of hospital costs in the US are attributed to hospital care. And when we start looking at, is there a better way we can manage risk? And if we can uh, uh, improve outcomes, the answer is quite clear. Next slide, please. So before COVID, we were seeing an incremental increase in adoption of telehealth. And the biggest barrier was not the, uh, not the availability of technology, but really policies and payment mechanisms that were uh, not in place. Next slide, please. And as we looked at COVID, and despite all the challenges that everybody has faced, it perhaps represents a tipping point for, health, uh, for telehealth, where all of a sudden government agencies and payers have begun to reimburse and, and uh, make it easier to, for patients and doctors to connect, to, uh, uh, to uh, connect with each other. Next slide, please. And as we look at the market for remote patient monitoring, it's expected to reach 31.3 billion by the end of 2023, up from near, uh, almost 16 billion in 2017. So we are clearly seeing the availability of technology and an openness, especially post COVID, to actually think about new ways of delivering care to patients globally. Next slide, please. Now, with technology comes another opportunity and a challenge. The growth in medical data is as much as 48% per year. And when you look at physicians and nurses as the front lines of care, and even uh, uh, public health agencies and executives who are looking to get insight from data, giving them large volumes of data at the point of decision-making is really not the solution. And we really need to be thinking about an inter integrated framework of technologies that actually allows us to capture data seamlessly, but also synthesize it perhaps using technologies like AI to deliver insights for better decision-making so that we can improve quality, improve safety, improve access to care and reduce cost of care while bringing the joy of medicine, uh, joy of practice back into medicine. Next slide, please. So currently we seem to be drowning in information and starving of wisdom. And I think this also creates an opportunity as we begin to think about how do we create ecosystem in the developing world to, to, uh, to reduce the disparities in the access to care and technology. Next slide, please. So as I think about this, you know, we need to work on multiple uh, levels. First of all, we need good policy aligned with strong incentives to really allow innovation to come to the forefront. And innovation is not simply de uh, developing new gadgets, it's actually innovation at all levels of care delivery and public health management. We really need to start focus, shifting our focus from data to insights. And, and as we start to look at uh, uh, containing costs and improving quality, we, will, we must start looking at inefficiencies that exist in our supply chain in healthcare. So the supply chain and the tools and equipment journey is very important for us to optimize and streamline so that we, we can begin to make the tools necessary for care delivery uh, where they're needed at a lowest cost. And then ultimately the, the, the patient journey and the provider journey are absolutely critical where we must design healthcare ecosystem that keep the needs of the patient and the consumer front and center. Healthcare ecosystem design with that end result in mind invariably will lead to an outcome that is unparalleled. Next slide, please. So as a primary care physician myself, you know, this is a, a classic picture and, and very romantic. And, and it sums up in one snapshot, what we mean by bringing the joy of practice into medicine and what sustainability may look like. Where instead of a doctor's black bag, we're empowering community health workers and frontline physicians in every country with a smart device that can allow uh, them to connect with patients in their home. And not only with physical visits, but with remote visits. And that is the power and the promise of telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Next slide, please. 
So I want to give you an example that uh, uh, is very close to my heart. Remember I told a story earlier on that uh, I had gone uh, to the Yucatan Peninsula as a first year medical student. And um, uh, when we left, the only thing we left that I thought created a lot of value was, was a book uh, where there's no doctor. Now I have the privilege to serve um, uh, on the board of Wings of Hope where I lead the global health programs. And we are uh, really focusing on how do we expand the mission to, uh, to change and save lives through power, of a through power of aviation and extend it to other technologies. Next slide, please. So currently the Wings of Hope serves, directly serves about 67,000 patients annually. And we provide indirect assistance to approximately, approximately 1 million individuals globally. Next slide, please. We have missions in Tanzania where we fly a plane into uh, 25 different settlements and provide uh, medical care, vaccinations, emergency evacuation. And we've ser served about 40,000 patients in, in Tanzania in 2018. Next slide, please. And Zambia, same thing. They're, they're the orthopedic surgeon and a plastic surgeon who help provide reconstructive surgery in Zambia. And this is the only uh, a provider of these services in that country. Next slide, please. So we also have partnership with the Colombian Civil Air Patrol who run uh, 12 brigades annually. Next slide, please. And the work they do is, is very impressive. Once a month, they pick a village with a runway and they take 40 to 50 volunteer health professionals, 10 to 15 planes and pilots, and two tons of supplies and equipment and uh, they set up a mini hospital to take care of uh, the populations. But as we talked to them about impact, they said, well, there's an unmet need. When we leave these villages, there's no follow-up care. And by the way, uh, you know, for, in pregnancy, if, if a woman uh, has a complication, the nearest hospital is 14 hour boat ride away. We can do better and we need your help in, in, in bringing telehealth and remote patient monitoring to these villages. Next slide, please. Two minutes, thanks. So, so amazing impact, but limited to once a year intervention at one of these 12 villages. Next slide, please. So Columbia came to the Wings of Hope and said, we want your help in getting telehealth, remote patient monitoring and drone program to augment our fixed wing program to impact health and well-being in these communities on a sustainable basis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, uh, previous slide, please. Yeah, so essentially the, the whole conversation began with in, in, uh, expanding and enhancing the impact and using emerging technologies to actually serve patients better. Next slide, please. So, so the whole paradigm from going to a community that have a physical runway shifted to what can we do with a digital runway? And what we call is uh, the, 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 uh, the thick purple circle, the circle of hope. Within the circle are the partners in the developing world and the communities that they're serving. And Wings of Hope has now expanded its, its uh, mission to really start looking at how we link aviation technology with drone technology, remote patient monitoring, virtual care and artificial intelligence, and with global vol volunteerism to actually reduce this disparity to technology, health and care, to empower the communities and take care of uh, patients locally in a sustainable manner. So the four values that, that really are driving uh, this model of care are sustainability, empowerment, stewardship, and scalability. Next slide, please. So as we look at how we begin to redesign healthcare globally, uh, th there are fundamental factors that, that, that exist uh, in many geographies. Leadership and vision absolutely is, is the key. We must begin with, with the end in mind. We must define what success looks like and work backward. Have public policy that actually is aligned with that and fund and, uh, and provide incentives for that right behavior, for the right change we're looking for. And ultimately it's empowering the frontline uh, executives, workers, public health professionals to do the right thing so they can align people, processes. Next slide and next please and technology, information communication technology to really allow innovation 
to happen at the front lines. Ultimately, innovation is not something that we do. Innovation should be ingrained as part of our culture. And I think this is the Renaissance moment in healthcare where we have the technology, we have the awareness, we have the need. And if we come together and join hands and actually begin to leverage tools like telehealth and remote patient monitoring and artificial intelligence and align it with the need, we can actually create some amazing transformative models of care globally and impact lives for every citizen in the world. There's absolutely no reason that every human being on this planet should not have access to quality care when it's needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manish. Great work um, and a lot for us to talk about. Remember your Q&A tab and chat um, with your questions and observations. And uh, Dr. Qualcomm. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the globe. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege for me uh, to share some of my thoughts on telehealth with you. Uh, the organizers, that's the IFNBCE, wanted me to talk about global perspectives and on uh, CE and telehealth, given my background as former chief of digital health at WHO. I've always believed that success or failure of a technology or innovation depends heavily on historical context. Too late um, and it's no use, too soon and there are issues of adoption. So the timing has to be just right. Hence the title of my talk, which in involves, uh, or which includes a subtitle, Surfing the Waves of Historical Context. My three main affiliations are shown. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Could you back up, please? Yes. Uh, my three main affiliations should appear there, but they, they don't. Oh yeah, they do appear. Next slide, please. Yep. Right. So what is um, telehealth? Well, most of us know what it means, but the tele comes from the Greek meaning at a distance. Uh, so telehealth is health at a distance. The term telemedicine itself was not uh, coined until 1967 by Ken Bird at uh, uh, Harvard University. Although the term was not coined until centuries later, it, it could just as well have been invented by the Greeks because the practice of telemedicine is as old as healthcare. Uh, in ancient times, telemedicine consisted of a person going to a healer on behalf of another person too sick to go themselves, describing their symptoms and coming back with recommendations from the healer. The process is pretty much the same today in that it involves three distinct pieces. That is somebody in need of help, somebody else who is capable to, of helping that person and some method of communication uh, between the two persons. So uh, as I said, much has not changed uh, since in this model since ancient times. What has mostly changed is the method of communication from a runner to smoke signals, to semaphore signals, to modern telecommunications via voice, text or video. One could actually argue that when the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell exclaimed, uh, Mr. Watson, I need you, supposedly. And Mr. Watson, who was in another room, heard him through the experimental device they were working on. This could be considered the first instance of modern telemedicine. Improvements in messaging and other communications technologies have not fundamentally changed the, the model they've simply modified the modality. Next slide, please. So um, let's start at the top, at the left side of this uh, graphic. In April, 1924, the editor of the radio news published this uh, cartoon of radio doctor, question mark, which foreshadowed the use of radio and other communications to care for the sick. At the bottom right, you see a photo from a telemedicine session in Canada in 2004, 80 years later. Note the similarities, a patient presenting symptoms through a contraption to a remote doctor, which 
uh, with each of them uh, talking to the other you know, through a screen. To go from the top left um, vision to that reality on the bottom right required a number of significant improvements in technology. In the top middle, we have uh, John von Neumann's architecture for a general purpose digital computing machine proposed in 1945. Um, in the lower middle, we have a stylized transistor uh, invented by William Shockley, um, Walter Bertain, and John Bardeen in the dying days of 1949. And on the top right, you have an integrated circuit first demonstrated by Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments in 1958. So it took all these technologies to make that dream come true. Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk about two landmark events in, um, in telemedicine or telehealth in general. Um, the first one has to do with a, a, a video called Wax, the delivery of tele, the discovery of television among the bees. Uh, this was shown on in May 1993, and I quote from then Vice President Al Gore's uh, account of it: a cult movie entitled Wax or the Discovery of Television Among the Bees was broadcast over the internet to a small worldwide audience who watched and listened to it live on their computers. The video was fuzzy and in black and white, and the audio sputtered in and out, but this digital moonwalk marked another small yet significant step towards the much heralded convergence of audio, video, and data. This event, end of quote, this event demonstrated the use of computers as an all-purpose communications device, combining the functions of a telephone, television, email, text, video clips, still images, and audio. And the next event, seminal event, was in April 1995, when an SOS email was sent around the globe on the internet requesting international help for a young Chinese female student suffering from an unknown but severe disease. This led to the first recorded internet diagnosis of Zhu Ling Ling with thallium poisoning. Today, we can routinely send images studies throughout the internet and carry out live demonstrations and remote consultations. Next slide, please. Recognizing the power of information and communication technology to support health, international bodies, bodies have sought to encourage countries to leverage information and communication technology to strengthen their health system. One such key global declaration was publicized by India's Union Minister for Health, JP Nada, who tweeted, I'm happy to share that the landmark resolution on digital health initiated by India was unanimously adopted. This was on 25th of May, uh, 2018. This followed similar declarations, uh, which many of you are familiar with, WISIS, um, that's the World Summit of the Information Society, World Health Assembly Resolutions on e-health and interoperability. And in 2019, the World Health Organization published the first ever guidelines on digital health with two of the 10 recommendations focused on telemedicine, client to provider telemedicine and provider to provider telemedicine. You know a medical practice has quote unquote arrived when a WHO guideline is issued on its use. Even so, initial uptake was slow as witnessed by unused funds for teleconsultation reimbursement at CMS in the US, uh, many years running at that. Uh, this despite some sparks of interest earlier as the creation of the Office for the Advancements of Telehealth in the US. Next slide, please. So in comes COVID. It took the coronavirus pandemic to bring telehealth to a new level. The lockdown created a spike in all things tele, doing things from a distance, uh, virtual visits, remote uh, provider to provide a consultation, remote monitoring that uh, Manisha so eloquently uh, talked about. All the significant fallouts from the pandemic have been an increase in these uh, tele activities. And in countries, there's been a call for use of telemedicine. 
and followed by, in some cases, a relaxation of previously very stringent uh, regulations on the use of these technologies. This has resulted in a plethora of telemedicine and telehealth offerings with anecdotal evidence of benefits from many quarters. In India, for example, the government has requested the ISFTH National Member Association, the Telemedicine Society of India, to provide training on telemedicine to 500,000 clinicians. A prequel to this came in March 2019 when McKinsey published its report titled Digital India, Technology to Transform an, a Connected Nation, in which they posit and quantify potential quality improvements and cost savings from telemedicine. The ISFTH itself has, uh, has supported uh, fighting of the pandemic in three key areas, action research, uh, sharing of information and providing expertise. Next slide, please. So the pandemic has taught us a lot. Uh, we have discovered in, in some cases, we discovered how to do things at a distance, whether in relation to work, play or health with information sharing and provision of expertise. And just last week on the 24th of September, uh, telehealth was announced as a key pillar of the US administration's new healthcare plan. Given that telehealth will improve access, this completes the three axes of the healthcare efficiency space, as again, very eloquently put by uh, Manish, quality, access, and cost. All of this can be seen as a global proof of concept for telehealth and in general doing things as much as we can at a distance. And we believe COVID-19 has therefore brought us to an inflection point for takeoff and global adoption of telemedicine. And we can leverage three other technologies uh, in this effort. Uh, these are medicines and technology uh, in the area of medicines and technologies where uh, point of care 3D printing uh, can be used, has already been used to, to print the first uh, pill that's approved by the FDA, can be used to produce medical devices for all sorts of purposes, and where the second technology supply chain uh, leveraging the use of drones. Again, Manish has, um, has talked about this. And finally, your artificial intelligence, machine learning and, um, and components of it like that, where expert systems um, can help support decision-making in health. Next slide, please. So the future of health is digital, but that future already exists as uh, William Gibson very adequately pointed out, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And around the globe, we see examples of that future in the US, in Australia, in Switzerland, where for example, 500, uh, sorry, 5,000 patients are seen in one city uh, virtually on a daily basis by uh, Medgate. And the interesting thing being that 50% of these encounters uh, completely resolve the issues with no need to go further into the healthcare system. Um, India also is another example of this. Next slide, please. So we want to be able to leverage the entire healthcare pyramid. Um, this is, a, on the left, there is a photo of uh, Francis Omaswa, who famously said, health is made at home and only repaired in institutions. And if you look at some of the literature, you'll find that, for example, as far back as uh, the year 2000, uh, it was, there, were, there was data to show that 70 to 90% of all interventions occur in the home and the community. So our telehealth, the telehealth that we, let, we want to deliver to leverage this new interest in uh, doing things at a distance needs to make sure that it leverages the most important resource in the health system, that's the people, uh, that it reaches previously unreached people and that extends the uh, catchment areas of health facilities to a boundless virtual community. Next slide, please. Two minutes, Yunkap, thanks. Yeah, all right. So the way forward is to create pool forces. And again, some all of this information is available in previous work that we've done. This is a model of how to create pool forces in countries. Next slide, please. This particular one talks about uh, you know, national societies. This element of the 
uh, of this framework deals with um, a network of excellence to be able to share information um, within the country as well as globally. Next slide, please. Right, so some work has already been done in this area uh, in a concept that we call the global knowledge commons. And basically the knowledge commons does the following. It answers the question, who is doing what, where, how well is it working? What can we learn from it? And what can we reuse from it? And that um, image on the right is the cover of a report that we published for the International Society of Telemedicine e -Health, published in collaboration with the Innovation Working Group in October 2015 on just how to create this global knowledge commons. Next slide, please. Right. Um, Manish again has talked about the issues of equity. Uh, some very uh, disturbing, impressive, but still disturbing data that more people have access to a mobile phone than to clean water, electricity, or toothbrushes. So the, the caution here is not to go overboard on digital. And remember that it takes many more aspects of daily life to produce health. And then when it comes to equity as distinct from equality, the lesson from that image on the left is that um, equal treatment does not always result in equity outcomes or equitable outcome. So we must target some of our interventions on the idea of um, supporting um, the underserved in a, or prior, in a prioritized manner. And already uh, there's some um, beginnings of the digital divide where based on a survey recently, you see that experts and um, health workers do not agree on what the digital priorities to be. Next slide, please. Right, so in conclusion, uh, we think this is a time for collective action because whatever um, contributions members of the ISFTH family may have made to the development of technology, all of that was recorded on the supply side, the technology supply side. We now need to work on the demand side, the, the for technology pull forces in countries using the framework uh, that we've, we've uh, proposed earlier. And this is where an institution like the IFMBE and the CED in particular, you know, have an important role to play so that we build these pool forces in countries and that contribution gets recognized under the brand and the name of these uh, societies like the IFMBE, like the ISFTH. And if you're wondering what you as an individual can do, you know, by joining this effort, I re refer you to the uh, famous quote from Margaret Mead, the American anthropologist, who said, never doubt that a small group of committed thoughtful individual citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Next slide, please. My final slide is, um, and my apologies to those who've seen this before, it's a conjecture um, that I have similar to Pierre de Fermat's conjecture um, called Fermat's last theorem, which says that for positive integers A, B, and C, that equation there is not uh, true for any n greater than two. This was um, postulated in um, 1637. It took 358 years to eventually prove this uh, in 1994, 95. Uh, so my postulate, my conjecture is the following. Click please. That for every dollar invested in telehealth, it will result in one DALI saved disability adjusted life year or one health adjusted life expectancy year earned. But the point is that the relationship is one of positivity. The proportionality constant could be anything, but you invest, you reap benefits. I hope it doesn't take 358 years to prove this, but the value of attempting to prove this lies not so much in whether it's right or wrong, but in attempting to do so, the data we gather, the research we do, will provide tremendous insights 
onto the, into the telehealth enterprise. And that can only be good for the development of telehealth and the use of telehealth to address health challenges. I thank you for your listening. Thank you, UNCAP, great job. Uh, so now we've had a global perspective um, from uh, Dr. Coley and Dr. Quancom. We're moved to a country perspective. And the first of those is clinical engineer, Pedro Galvin, who uh, has been in the Ministry of Health Paraguay for several years. And they implemented telemedicine, cellular telehealth several years ago. So we're seeing sort of an advanced case of what you can do with these tools there. And then followed by uh, Adrian Pacheco, from uh, Ministry of Health Mexico, Cenatech, and how they're uh, developing their telehealth program in Mexico. Take it away, Pedro. Thank you, Tom, for the invitation to participate at this webinar. Uh, uh, I will try to give you an overview of how telemedicine experience using artificial intelligence for COVID-19 diagnosis can help and is helping uh, as clinical engineering uh, influencing telehealth. Next, please. Our team is compounded of a multidisciplinary group where you can find uh, biomedical, clinical engineers, physicians, uh, informatics, and uh, pneumologists. Next, please. Creative use of artificial intelligence machine learning, information and communication technology, as well medical devices offers, as you know, many opportunities uh, how you can uh, through the enhance the healthcare during the current COVID-19 pandemic in many countries around the world. One of the challenge for clinical and biomedical engineers, physicians and medical informatics is to develop AI systems to enhance the global health. Populations, as you know, living in low setting countries did not have access to specialized care and quality diagnosis services like RT-PCR for COVID-19 and thus depend on the scarce resources of their health system. Inside such countries don't exist equity between urban and rural populations. In this context, the automated AI system for COVID-19 diagnosis based on telemedicine platform should be directed toward alleviating the current lack of highly trained radiologists to perform diagnosis of CT imaging at the district and regional hospitals countrywide and serve as triage to rationalize RT, PCR and human resources in low setting countries. The utility of such automated AI system for COVID-19 diagnosis to mitigate the situation challenge uh, was investigated in this case. Next, please. Regarding the measles, this was a descriptive study carried out by the telemedicine unit of the Ministry of Health of Paraguay in collaboration with the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging of the Health Science Research Institute and the University of the Basque Country to evaluate the utility of the automated AI system based on telemedicine platform for COVID-19 diagnosis. The results divided in four likelihood levels for COVID. That means low, medium, high, and severe level was obtained by the tailored AI system implemented in 14 public countryside community hospital, where we analyzed comparing clinical characteristics and imaging features. The goal of our project was to explore the utility of automated AI system based on telemedicine platform for COVID-19 diagnosis to expand the role of chest X-ray imaging using computer tomography in diagnosing and assessing coronavirus infection so that it can be more than just a screening tool for signs of COVID in patients' lungs. Next, please. Here you can see the operation schema of our implemented system. On the left, you can see how a picture a chest CT imaging will process through the, the, the AI system 
involved in a cloud. And of the right side, you can see how are our CT devices uh, spread countrywide. The next, please. As results, we can say we have 430 remote diagnoses as screening were performed between March and August 2020 in 14 district regional and specialized lungs hospitals across the country. 62.6% .6 correspond to male, as you know in the, in the world is the, the same average, and 37.5%. 4% to female. The average age of the patients was 50.7 years. The majority of the COVID-19 patients, that means 59%, were young and in the interval of 19 to 59 years old. Both used AI systems have different background information. That means fusing molecular, clinical, epidemiological, and imaging data to detect COVID-19. Such a system, that means the AI system, learned from abnormalities to arrive at a diagnosis on its own. That is very important to remember because that is the reason because we found uh, the difference between two implemented, two different implemented AI system. At this picture, you can see the age group distribution of diagnosed patients for COVID-19. As you can see, the most of the people were between 19 and 59 years old. Next, please. The diagnosis of the two tailored AI system implemented implemented in 14 public countryside community hospitals were analyzed comparing clinical characteristics and imaging features. Four likelihood levels for COVID, that means low, medium, high, and severe, were determined through the two AI systems. The comparability difference between the two AI diagnoses was 19% for low, 65% percent for medium, 53% for high, and 64% for severe level. As you, uh, you can remember, the difference is to find in the learn process of both AI system with information regarding patients with uh, COVID-19 diagnosis. At this picture, you can see the comparison of likelihood levels for COVID-19 diagnosis. As you can see on the left, most of the people were in the level of zero to 25%. That's because we have catch all our patients at the beginning of the disease of COVID-19 maybe. And on the right, you can see how many people from this group were evolving and having the, maybe the, the infection in the lung. Next, please. The most common findings evaluating clinical characteristics and imaging features of COVID-19 on sequential chest CT examinations were severe pneumonia, bilateral pneumonia with pleural effusions, bilateral pulmonary emphysema, diffuse ground glass opacity, paralysis of hemidiaphragm, calcified granuloma in lead, sequelae of TB, bilateral emphysematous and fibrotic changes, and traction bronchiectasis. Next, please. At this picture, you can see the most common findings in the low likelihood level for COVID. That means the distribution of type and number of pathologies diagnosed by the pneumologists and imaging specialists and a distance. And as you can see, this is the, the group where you can find the majority of the patients. This is between zero and 25% of probability to have COVID at the beginning of the illness. You can see that uh, most of the people or the patients were to evaluate by pneumologists because it was not clear for the AI system to make a diagnosis 
regarding COVID. The second group was the pathologies of another etiology. That means that was not uh, correctly to diagnose COVID from the pictures, from the X-ray chest imaging. The third group was normal, and the fourth group was viral lung diseases of another etiology. Next, please. Now, an important cost reduction, that means patient's displacement, RT, PCR, and human resources was obtained through the automated AI system for COVID diagnosis. The other results were the more important role of CT, and that is to highlight right now, was in finding lesions and evaluating the effects of treatment for the physicians. This is the uh, finding of the pneumologist. AI enhanced telemedicine tool can perform a risk certification of patients. It's very important in four levels. Why? To decide which type of care they need based on the predicted course of their COVID infection. That is another very important finding for the pneumologists and for the ICU physicians in order to not to collapse the, the hospitals countrywide. And the last result was deter, determined AI sensitivity for COVID-19 was 93% that was obtained comparing AI system diagnosis versus RT-PCR in lab. The next, please. And according to our findings, in conclusion, AI technology based on a telemedicine system could help to develop a diagnosis platform for COVID-19 and uh, other respiratory pathologies that enhance the capabilities sorry, of medical imaging diagnosis at countryside hospitals, as well as speeding the delivery of chest image diagnosis for suspected patients during COVID-19 pandemic. And very important, rationalizing scare RT, PCR, and specialized human resources in low setting countries like Paraguay. As you see, we are implementing all what Juncap and uh, Manish have said regarding the technology on to show you how clinical and biomedical engineers in a very uh, important research group, uh, multidisciplinary with another specialized people like ph physicians, uh, informatics and ICU people, pneumologists can help the world to, to give a, the opportunity as a technologist to give the solution for this pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm open to your question. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A tab or possibly through chat and we'll move on to uh, Adrian um, from Cenatec in Mexico. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, hi, everybody, and thank you, Tom, for this invitation. Glad to be here and share some information and experiences about telemedicine from the perspective of a bi biomedical engineer inside of a Ministry of Health. It is clear that COVID became a catalyzer of the implementation of telehealth. Also, we can see that telehealth service became every day more common. In some cases, it is almost something normal to give medical service using IT. Technological development is a normal process. Innovation is a natural phenomenon and the, that affect telehealth as well as many other technologies. People, patients, consumer are looking, are looking every day for more service based on IT. Use for being more comfortable, sometimes for get something efficient and sometimes for a real need. This natural growing, uh, uh, please, uh, we keep in the, in the, in the uh, yes, thank you. This natural growing do not happen by itself. This natural growing, it is the result of a compendium of skill, knowledge, processes, and applied technology, and mainly by a group of people who develop their creativity, imagination, and put knowledge into a practice 
for the development of technologies that support telehealth services. It is then evident that whoever is prepared to face this change will be able to make better use of the tools and resources available. As in any evolution, whoever adapts more quickly to the change will have a competitive advantage and will offer more benefits to their users and consumer. It is true also that telemedicine and digital health increased considerably uh, with COVID-19 pandemic, but not all institutions have been able to adapt to the changes. However, we are still in a good moment to transform a small step into a great big steps supported by legislators, opinion leaders, decision makers. With a doubt, now telemedicine as a solution is here and now. Next slide, please. One of the areas on telehealth that has grown the most in Mexico, and I believe that in all Latin America, is the interpretation of radiological images. The digital digitization of this system has a low easy distribution while maintaining high quality and safety standards. We see radiological information can easily incorporate into hospital information system, but now new change arises and it is incorporated to the request of doctors and or patients from, for example, web pages or even from application on their smartphone, which is sometimes accompanied by a video call or even from a chat talk. Following the normality of digital transformation and the incorporation of new elements to medical digital system, one of the many challenges now is to incorporate these simple, even inexpensive and accessible elements to a very much, a very much more robust model or system with high security and with large work of standardization and consensus such as the hospital information system. Next slide, please. So given all these changes, it can be a little bit confusing to follow certain lines of work. International organizations that are experts on these issues such as the World Health Organization recommend work, working on the path of standardization of process. Catalog, message, to seek interoperability between different systems, plat platforms, and applications. Consider, considering that, even more and more health professionals carry on their own electronic devices or equipment, as well as patients who prefer the information in their own phones and computer. So it is necessary to have multidisciplinary teams with clinical profiles capable to communicate with the population, with the community, uh, personnel who knows about information security, quality of the data and the information. Funding those profiles has become very complicated. Now the team, I mean the human resources inside of the hospitals go far beyond uh, just the doctor and a nurse. Next slide, please. A little more than 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to participate, participate in a telemedicine program. When some trucks adapted, with some yeah, trucks adapted, we carry a mobile consulting room in the back. We used to visit some small town located in the south uh, part of my country, communities located in mountains and places hardly accessible. Through a satellite connection, we were able to communicate student doctors with general practitioners and specialist doctors located in Mexico City. The truck had basic medical equipment in addition to ultrasound, electrocardiograph, equipment for basic blood chemistry tests, and as well as an examination camera and some other accessories that communicate with an electronic medical record. The experience was fundamental in my professional career. Since then, I have worked into operation of telemedicine programs, 
the implementation of these programs. Later, I had the opportunity to join the Federal Ministry of Health in my country to support the design, planning, and monitoring of telemedicine and telehealth programs and projects. Like most of the technologies that are incorporated into the health system, there are topics and areas in which technological improvement is required, from refining process, developing electronic interface to facilitate the work of the personnel who attend the patients. Next slide, please. One of the bigger, biggest challenges we have faced in the development and operation of telemedicine project has been the integration of several medical devices with information system. In a context of limited economic resources, it is very important to operate the project as quickly as possible in an appropriate way. At the moment, international and at that moment, international collaboration became your great ally. Knowing the results of similar experience um, is one of my recommendations is to establish support networks with other similar organizations in other countries. It is true that the systematic review of scientific information or document, documents in scientific journal I read, are great help, but the experience of those who have implemented similar projects is invaluable. We create working groups with local telemedicine coordinators. The objective of this workforce was to establish support networks to facilitate the implement, implementation and monitoring and evaluation of the telemedicine projects. Next, please. As projects are implemented, it is very useful to share experience, results, and best practices. Therefore, knowledge management is one of the great pillars, solid foundation of any telemedicine program. Sharing information to webinar, workshops, seminars, discussion tables, and congress are essential to motivate and encourage dialogue between academic, scientific, industry, and caregivers. The digital tools that we currently have allow us to establish a much faster communication. Never underestimate the experience of some who has already implemented a project. She or she will for sure save you some headache and will help you to establish goal in the shortest possible time. Some of our results are to reduce the waiting time to be seen by a specialist doctor from six weeks to one week. In particular, for those patients who were in a remote place and far from the big cities. Also 62, 65% of patients of telemedicine programs are fully resolved without the patient having to travel to a second level of care. Next, please. Uh, as in the vast majority of countries in the world, we identify technology tools that help us to find relevant information for the fight against COVID-19, like chat support by cognitive assistance, medical guidance, phone calls, direct video consultation with the patient, remote monitoring of patients through their mobile phones. Once again, the support of international organization was essential to adapt remote medical care model for the follow-up of our patients and citizens. And this time, time, information and communication technologies plays a very important role for communication among health professionals. For the communication of health professionals with patients and patients with their families. Some of our institutions train 100% of their health professionals with uh, action against COVID just because they had projects supported by telemedicine and telehealth. Some other institutions follow up with more than 80 patients daily using video calls. We are still building this ecosystem. We have very good results and as soon the activities allow us to make a better analyze, we will be able to present results to identify the most efficient practice. Together, 
with uh, institution in charge of creating laws and regulation, we are working to strengthen the legal framework that support the practice of telehealth in my country. With other organizations, we are incorporating variables that identify the new health actions that use telemedicine and telehealth technology. I mean, official variables, official, um, official variables. The industry has moved very fast and offers various solutions uh, such as electronic prescription, personalized electronic and medical records, platform of telemedicine with high standard of safety and quality. Doctors and patients are very convinced that telemedicine is one of the solutions to attend the current pandemic. We understand that it will never be the same as face-to-face. -face. However, we also understand that because low mobility, right now telemedicine represents the only way to get care services for a big percentage of citizens and patients. Next, please. Even with COVID present in our lives, the care of other diseases must continue. We are developing models that allow us to support the resolution capacity of the human resources establishes in the first level of care. It is evident that we cannot incorporate technology very sophisticated in all first level care medical units, but we can use the infrastructure and resources that allow us to use doctor and patients seeking to establish continuous, safe, and interoperable communication as much as possible to facilitate communication, not only between doctors, but also among all health professionals. Our Two new minutes. model Thank are you. more focused on better coordination and management of service and information. However, the technology itself represents the first link in this model. And like I did say in the beginning of this talk, the great challenge for engineers is to adequate the world of medical technologies with the world of accessible devices that are in the hands of a good number of citizens. When I mean a big number of citizens. Next, please. Digital health telemedicine, telehealth is strongly present inside or uh, of our health institution. Citizens, patients, consumer demand more and more service support by this type of technology. The right question is not to identify if telemedicine will become part essential of this service of any health institution. The question, should rather seek the answer in relation to how long or how, yeah, how long that institution will be able to provide service based on IT that allow the care of patients remotely with security of the information, integrity of data and interoperability that use information in different system and platform. The team, the human resource must be multidisciplinary Doctors who know about technologies, I mean, medical doctors who know about technologies, physicians that know about technologies, and engineers that understand very well the medical process. I appreciate your time and the attention you pay to this talk. There are many things that need to be done. Information that we can share among all, the situation are very similar and we all face common troubles. Please continue talking. Please continue with the debate and with the aim to improve access and quality of care for all patients and citizens. My name is Adrian Pacheco. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Adrian. Great job. Um, we got last two speakers. We said at the beginning that we're going to go a bit long today because we've got such a power packed team and so many issues we want to cover. So uh, engineer Martin Weiss from uh, Jimby Health in South Africa, whose organization is uh, enabling mobile health across Africa. And then uh, last but certainly not least, Dr. Jatenda Sharma on digital health initiatives in India from his very key role there, many of you know about. Take it away, Martin. And while Martin's coming on, we'll probably go until noon New York time. So it'll be a two hour program. Thank you, Martin.
and you're on mute at the moment. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now, I'm assuming? Yes, it's great. Uh, right, thanks, thanks very much for this opportunity to uh, show some of the um, technology that we um, building in in Africa and I think it's it's quite pertinent to some of the discussions going around uh, telehealth so our, my perspective is, is a little bit different we're looking at um, a, a systems approach to telehealth for African countries <clears throat> just a little bit about me my, my background is uh, electronic engineering I'm electronic engineer by birth uh, and did a master's in biomedical engineering, but spent most of my uh, working career in telemetry, which is also a type of tele service, but it's a tele, te the remote monitoring of uh, electronic devices, uh, mostly in mobile uh, uh, networks. Um, and that was mainly in large corporates for profit, and I now find myself in a small non-profit public uh, uh, development company um, doing fantastic work in providing uh, uh, system support for health systems in Africa. So Jembi was started uh, as a spin-off from our South African Medical Re Research Council, um, and currently we have uh, around 28 developers and a, a staff complement of 130 um, in about eight African countries uh, where we have uh, fairly large projects. Uh, we are a global partner and work uh, closely with governments, universities, international donors, and other nonprofit organizations. In March 2018, uh, we established a collaborating center for digital health innovation. Um, and the aim of that is to promote and support digital health innovation locally and within the region. And that was done with our South African Medical Research Council. So today I'm really going to talk uh, about a, uh, three main topics. One is the challenges associated with mHealth in our region. Um, and um, then what are we doing as Gembi to try and mitigate uh, some of these uh, challenges? And then I'll just show a quick two samples of um, projects that we're doing that use appropriate technology for the region. So the challenges that face, face mHealth implementations in Africa uh, are, are really interesting. And, and some research that I did um, there are, over the last nine years, there are over 400 mHealth pilots uh, that were launched in, over, uh, in 35 African countries at a cost of over $80 million. Um, and when we talk about mHealth here, uh, mHealth is a subset of digital health and m replies to mobile, uh, applies to mobile. And of that, we have telehealth, which is a subset of M health in for for uh, for this category. So, of these 400 M health pilots uh, that were launched, only three of them scaled to a national level. And you know, if you think of that, that's that's a huge failure. Um, and there there are, are real reasons why this has happened. And those reasons. Um, th th there's been some local research um, as well as the World Health Organization has done research on why this has happened. And there are really five main categories why, what these, these uh, challenges fall into. So it's, the, the, and the main one, as far as I'm concerned as well, is governance. If you haven't got a governance structure and a national buy-in to what you're trying to achieve, there's very little chance of, of the project succeeding. It just doesn't become a priority within national health. Uh, the second is donor alignment. So um, very often donors and national ministries don't have the same strategy or the same agenda, which is challenging because it means that, again, you have donors who are, are prepared to fund projects uh, in, in African countries, but if it's not of the same priority uh, and falls within the strategy of, of a national 
uh, Department of Health, there's very little chance of this thing scaling. Interoperability is mentioned numerous times um, by my, my previous colleagues, um, and it's, it's a, a huge issue. I think one of the opportunities in Africa is that because we're starting more or less at the ground zero when it comes to digital health, we're able to leapfrog and ensure interoperability happens from day one. Whereas I think may, may, maybe in more uh, advanced countries where digital health is already implemented and you have no interoperability, you have a bigger challenge of trying to migrate and integrate disparate data services. Sustainability also has been mentioned a number of times. So if we don't have plans of sustaining these technologies, they will not work. Um, and that includes things like the type of batteries a device uses. You know, if we use a, a particular device and that is built around a battery that only comes from one particular supplier in Sweden, then it's not going to scale. You need to develop your technology, which uses appropriate power supplies, so AA or AAA batteries, for example. Um, and then most ministries also do not have the capacity to implement these kind of programs, and you need partners to help the ministries in implementing these programs. So how we work or how we try to work is we try to assist national and intergovernmental authorities to develop policies around digital health, mobile health, um, how to develop strategies in, in, in deciding what apps are important to, to, um, to implement. Um, and then how do you implement these, um, these kind of projects so that they take ground, so that people understand it, there, there isn't um, rejection of the technology and it gets adopted. This also provides direction for the implementers, for the donors and, and for developers as well. We try to standardize everything uh, on, on frameworks. South Africa has a particularly good uh, normative health standards framework. Um, and we try to promote this in, in other countries as well. Um, it, it removes redundancy and duplication of efforts uh, and allows third parties to work together for a common cause. And then uh, we adopt interoperability standards um, based on a health information exchange model, which is um, uh, also proposed by the, the World Health Organization. So that means that patient health, patient informa information is transportable, not only within a country, but across a region. Um, and it's based on two of these protocols. One is called HL7 and the newer one is called FHIR. F -H -I -R. And then the, the, the fourth part that we try to do is we try to propose that all these technologies have some kind of built-in monitoring and evaluation um, in the implementation stages. So, and these are not necessarily only health metrics um, and indicators, but it's technology indicators as well. Things like uh, what model phones are being used, when are they charged, uh, what is the little level of connectivity, uh, uh, how much data has been used. And these allow us to also have a look at what applications are more sustainable than others. So the first project uh, that I want to go through is a, it's a solution that we built for South Africa, who's, who's rolling out a program of community health workers. We under-resourced when it comes to clinics, we under-resourced when it comes to medical professionals, our clinics don't have enough nursing staff. So the model is around community health workers and getting the community health workers access to the National Department of Health data information. So what we have built locally is a bespoke app store. Um, and the app store allows a healthcare worker, a registered healthcare worker to log in and get access to particular apps that our National Department of Health can load into that app store. Um, as part of this, what we've done as well, uh, is it's based on a technology called reverse build, which means that the community health worker can have zero balance on her mobile device, uh, but still be able to download these apps and interact with the apps um, at no cost to the community health worker. And this is important for, for uh, operationally, how do you pay community health workers in large numbers stipends accurately and monthly. 
In this case, you don't have to worry about the data costs. It's all taken care of. It's also multi-tenanted, which means it's a tool that can scale down to organizations, to other partner programs, um, to pilot projects, uh, and to user groups. So it can be run as research as a research tool as well. And built into this is a content management platform where third parties can uh, access a, um, an editor where they can create user guides and uh, content that gets served optimally for mobile, uh, mobile devices. And my screen is frozen. So this is a um, just some snapshots of the dashboard of what the what the Department of Health would would log into. Uh, here, there's a demonstration company, Martin's demonstration company. I can see at any stage how many active users are on my my are registered with my company, um, uh, how many apps are loaded into the company, and how how much data has been used. I can then see the names of the, of the users. I can upload a list of names and I can manually add a name if necessary. I can then associate, I'm just gonna go back there. I can associate that user with a particular user type um, and I can uh, uh, group them into provinces or any kind of uh, tag that, that I, I wish to tag a group of, of users. I can also send, um, instant notifications that pop up on the uh, healthcare worker's phone. Um, and as well as then here, link uh, any application that I have in my store down to particular users. So it becomes very flexible and very usable uh, in managing community health workers. These are just some of the apps that we are working on uh, either ourselves or through third parties to, um, to populate uh, some of the applications and migrate them onto the app store. So we have some user guides, national user guides over here. We have a national road to health booklet, which is the digital version of the paper-based digital road to health booklet. Um, and then we have some bespoke apps for the Department of Health around stock out and around central um, medicines dispensing. Uh, part of the, um, the work that we do is with the Medical Research Council, uh, who also have research units like the African Health Research Institute, um, who are developing tracking applications for tracking HIV and TB patients. Um, and these are research tools that, if scale, seamlessly can scale into a national department of health as well. The second project is, is for me, a really interesting project. It's a cross-border immunization tracking project that we implemented on the, on the border of Kenya and Uganda. It was funded by, the, by USAID, um, and the client is EGAD, which is the Intergovernmental Authority on Development in, in East Africa. Uh, it was implemented in uh, September 2018, so that's about two years ago, uh, almost to the day. And um, uh, we implemented it in four clinics uh, in close proximity. They're about four to eight kilometers apart. We trained four healthcare workers in this uh, novel technology, which I'll show you now, um, and kind of left them alone to see how um, the others would adopt the technology. And today there are over 18 users uh, who have uh, upskilled themselves based on these four health, uh, original four healthcare workers. Uh, to date, there have been 15,000 new registrations, that's mothers uh, registering their babies or infants with this uh, immunization tracking application or program uh, with over 100,000 immunization events. Um, and in the last two years, we've had you know, almost no downtime of the whole system. Um, it's completely offline if necessary. It's also online. It has minimal power requirements. It's self-sufficient uh, as far as power is concerned, either runs off mains or runs off solar, and it has internal batteries. It has a local storage and a local server, as well as a cloud uh, um, storage, and it's designed modular uh, for local support and maintenance. Martin, two minutes to go. Thanks. Okay, so this is how it works. So a healthcare worker logs in, she has a NFC card, which is a typical kind of credit card that you have in your pocket. It holds the pin for the healthcare worker. She types it in and then she gets access to the app. The uh, mother then arrives who also has a card. She 
takes the card from the mother, taps it on the back of the phone, and gets access to the mother's, the infant's immunization record. Um, the healthcare worker can then do whatever she needs to do, give whatever vaccination she needs to, to give. And um, uh, let's just let this catch up. So uh, it also tracks if an event wasn't um, uh, recorded for out of stock reasons. Um, and then finally, what the, the healthcare worker does is take the card, tap the card again to the back of the phone, and that writes the information onto the card. So the mother work, walks away with her health record on the card, as well as then stored on the cloud. Simple, effective technology. It reduces the, the time a healthcare worker spends uh, doing administrative work from 15 minutes down to three minutes. So she can spend a lot more time with the patient. Um, this is just a bigger solution and I'll skip over that. So just to go back to what our landscape is, just to give you some context. So there is transport in, in, in the region where we work. It's just not the transport that we, um, that we used to, but it's, it's there, and if we use it properly, we can get technology to work wherever we need to. It means that when we want to use satellite technology, for example, we can't use the technology that uses a 1.2 meter satellite dish, because I can't get it onto the back of a scooter. I need something more appropriate. There's also electricity. Um, we just have to make sure that we use electricity appropriately in these environments. And finally, again, there is telecommunications. We just got to make sure that we use the telecommunications properly. And I think that is it. Thank you very much. Wow, thanks so much, Martin. Great job. And uh, as we switch over presenters to Dr. Jatinder Sharma, uh, who is no stranger to you and leads this incredible effort in India where they're actually beginning to implement a, digi a national digital health initiative. So take it away, Dr. Sharma. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, I start my presentation with a bit of inferiority complex because uh, my presentation does not have very exciting pictures. And for some reason, uh, when I received the template, I thought uh, the template had four slides. So I thought I have to fit in everything in four slides. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, um, uh, please excuse me if my information is 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 is, um, is not as exciting. Uh, uh, but but thank you for the opportunity. Um, in the context of telehealth, uh, four years ago, uh, the National Teleradiology Program of India was brought out. Mm, which now has crossed over 5 million image analysis just by teleradiology. And that's a federally funded program under the National Health Mission. But what we realized over a period of time that telehealth has, uh, has, has five components. Now, component one is the teleconsultation by physicians, which has a complication that uh, the legal act which allows for a prescription does not allow for a teleprescription uh, in many countries. Uh, so teleconsultation by a physician always comes with an unknown devil as to who would prescribe and whether that teleprescription would be uh, valid in other regions. The second component is the use of tele-tools uh, like we do in image analysis or uh, uh, analysis of, of pathology slides. Now, these tools are applications commercially available that make us take a decision based on, based on the capabilities of a software, which could range from theoretically 0% to 100%. And the risks and benefits associated with these tools uh, come generally as part of a contractual agreement between the supplier of the tool and the user of the tool. The third component is non-consultative, non-patient consultative uh, diagnostic telehealth, like teleradiology, teleophthalmology. We also have a large teleophthalmology program in India that operates as part of National Health Mission. And the fourth 
in the last component uh, and the fourth component of the of the telehealth uh, is the uh, uh, is is the health systems harmonization because if multiple systems uh, serve telehealth using multiple uh, uh, standards there would be a lack of harmonization and therefore lack of interoperability and the fifth and the last component is the is the access of telehealth record by patients which uh, which is uh, more to do with email, uh, the information storage archival and use over a prolonged period of time now practically speaking when a health system battles through these five baskets of telehealth uh, uh, interface with the health system a large number of challenges across a large number of stakeholders uh, come out and therefore uh, um, this with, with the experience uh, of 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 running national programs like teleradiology teleophthalmology or so on and the learnings from those systems uh, uh, couple of months ago on the 15th of august the national digital health mission was announced in india which captures the problems across these five baskets across all the stakeholders that you see on the slide uh, right there right from hospitals to the doctors to the ngos associations regulators and the governments and 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 synthesizes those 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 problems uh, with their potential solutions as a package and that package is national digital health mission which has a series of uh, interventions uh, the 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 most important intervention being bringing of a digital health locker uh, attached to every citizen's health profile a digital health locker that captures the information created by every episode of a patient across every point of the health system and archives them in one place so that it can be accessed used synthesized and, uh, and 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 applied for patient's health continuum across the care process across system so in a slide all i wanted to share is that as a country india has embarked on a very emphatic and very 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 challenging uh, 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 journey uh, uh, which is creating a backbone of digital health across the national health mission making a digital national digital health mission now that's regarding the application of 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 digital health and telehealth from a public governance perspective but many countries like india including india also have a very large very very large private healthcare provider base uh, and and in in if access to health system is possibility in these countries it is also uh, because of this large public uh, private healthcare provider base but these provider bases are fragmented some come from small some are in the range of small clinics and some network of large hospitals and small clinics and large hospitals they have their own choices and challenges with telehealth and digital health solutions particularly the electronic medical records and therefore i i just request to go to the next slide a uh, digital digital health alliance for india is now emerging uh, uh, with 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 dialogues with with global stakeholders as a, a, a as as a gateway as a united uh, platform for multiple providers of digital health that provide services right from uh, patient records to managing health records hospital records for a hospital um, archiving storage analytics and interoperability within systems multiple providers of digital and electronic health record systems uh, the effort is to make them converge on a common gateway so that hospitals that are fragmented particularly in the private sector which are small to medium size can opt to choose providers of 
electronic medical record systems as per their needs in a cost effective manner. Next slide, please. Now, the key feature as envisaged for now that the Digital Health Alliance in India would have is one, it would use the data and metadata standards, which are, uh, which are already uh, announced uh, in India uh, three years ago. Uh, so the, uh, the, the commonality across the provider base would be on the uh, legally valid data and metadata standards. Two, it would have a free and a paid basket, uh, free to the extent it's possible to keep the project sustainable and paid to the extent of choices and features that the hospital seek. Now, what this does is, what this, this, this could potentially do is large number of providers could come on a common gateway and large number of hospitals could select a provider for a certain period of time, each provider agreeing more like an airline alliance to provide a common set of features that are free. It could be as little as patient registration, but even that is important. In fact, the most important step in a telehealth pathway. And two, it could, the, the various providers could, could, could announce the cost at which they provide the additional services like analytics, storage, advanced modules such as that for laboratory or ICU care and so on. Therefore, even those hospitals, care providers and clinics, which do not have large budgets to implement everything can start their journey from a free basket, which is really small and, and good enough to start patient records and, and building upon it with time. And three, it has a very cost effective approach and, and across providers, there is a consensus which is being built that, that, that uh, 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 the, 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 the cost of providing electronic health record need not be upfront. It could be more like a rental reagent contract that we are used to in our laboratories when the machine comes for free, but we pay for reagents every month. So instead of an upfront huge investment on electronic health records and telehealth solutions, which, which restricts and, 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 and inhibits a, a, a healthcare setup to go for a telehealth solutions in electronic medical records. This, this financial model is more on a cost per bed per month basis, which means like in electricity, you consume and you pay on a per month basis for a certain number of declared beds over the period of the contract really reducing the cost, the upfront cost of capital and the upfront cost of acquiring these systems. Next slide, please. Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, there, there are practical solutions like uh, the, the app for uh, midwife and, and, and uh, village level health workers. Uh, there are solutions for teleradiology, teleophthalmology. Uh, there are also solutions that we have tried three years ago on, on deep analytics mm, uh, on, on, the, on the digital health solutions. Uh, but, but going forward, I think bringing together the demand and the supply, the providers and the seekers together is where we see the volume of business, a convergence of, of service models, and, and, and the demand uh, pulling the supply like an engine. And that's why the G Digital Health Alliance India that's going forward in times to come. Thank you very much, Tom, for the opportunity. And I look forward to comments and questions. Great, Jatender. Um, let me, as we enter here 15, 20 minutes of Q&A time, uh, give the floor for a moment to my co-moderators, Manish and Yuncap, just for some of their summary statements. Manish? Yes. What have you um, heard this morning? So, so first of all, thank you to all the panels and, and certainly a, a, a thank you to Tom uh, and the team for putting this panel together. I, I think what we clearly see is, is an excitement uh, and an opportunity uh, that lies ahead of us. Uh, I think we've seen some wonderful examples of uh, local success stories and, and global vision uh, that uh, 
uh, you know, allows us to frame what we need to do. I think the one big thing that um, comes out is how can CEs play a big role in this? And I would say, take it a step further. Healthcare is a team sport. It is not a single uh, specialty, single domain uh, endeavor. And I think in the future, we must bring in all the bright minds to begin to think about how we begin to look at solutions for uh, local geographies. Because we have a new set of tool sets, tools, uh, technologies that are available to us, but the solutions are going to come at the local level. So working together at the leadership level to ensure that we mobilize funding, we impact thought leadership and policy, and we actually uh, begin to uh, impact and empower frontline caregivers and health systems to, uh, to use these new technologies. Uh, and, and really impact lives in a meaningful manner. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. So I'm, I'm really grateful to see all the great work that's happening in South America, in Africa, and in India. So thank you to, uh, to all for, for your leadership and the work uh, uh, that you're doing. But we have, uh, as, as Robert Frost would say, we have miles to go before we sleep. Thanks so much, Manish. Yoon Cap, hey, you've been around this space for a while. You didn't have that gray hair when I first knew you working on it. So. Thanks, Tom. I, I, I mean, after Manish's summary, I, I have very little to add because um, I, I share the um, the excitement about the these um, discussions. I also share a huge frustration, huge frustration, because we all, when we get together like this, and dis, the discourse is very stimulating, it's very exciting, and raises hope that something further will happen. But in my experience, which you've alluded to, uh, very little happens, particularly in comparison with the expectations. Now, so I have just one point to add to Manisha's um, excellent summary um, of, you know, of all the great um, uh, presentations and, um, and lenses through which people have looked at uh, telehealth and the COVID um, um, experience. What I'd like to add is to emphasize the one point that I made, which was probably lost in the many slides, which is um, knowledge sharing. Just, just picture for a moment, if each of us knew what everyone else listening to us now on this panel knows. Just imagine that. If I knew what everybody else on this panel knows and everyone else on the panel knows what all of us know, it would be a very powerful way of solving the challenges that we face, not just in telehealth, because I firmly believe that somewhere on this planet, whatever challenges you're facing with health and bringing technology to bear on health, somewhere, somewhere, someone else has faced something similar, maybe even found a solution, but they don't know about you, you don't know about them. So I really uh, implore everyone to think about what the International Society for Telemedicine uh, has been in some ways harping on for, um, for years, the idea of a global knowledge commons even if it's a vertical in that space on telehealth alone, for us to be able to share that graphic that I presented, who is doing what, where, how well is it working, what can we learn from it, and what can we reuse from it? I'd like to be able to, to, to get uh, Jitendra's uh, experience on how they're resolving the regulatory issues where you can do teleconsultation, but you can't do teleprescription. The same issues arose in South Africa many years ago with the HPCSA, you know, objecting to, um, you know, to telemedicine in general. So th there's so much that is happening, but we have no way of, or the ways we have of sharing these so that everybody can learn from everybody else are not being followed. So my, um, that's my huge disappointment, despite the excitement that I feel, perhaps this is the moment when all of this will start falling together. Well, Yuncap, I wanna address that and then give uh, Elliot and uh, Jatender a chance to respond also. So um, CED, 
you know, we're not the end of the world, but, you know, we can't do everything. But we've seen this huge change with our knowledge network this in 2020. You know, I tell the story that we were working after our program in Rome, our Congress in Rome last October with 80 countries. And now we're working with 170, sharing best practices, sharing our knowledge network with these 21 webinars across a variety of topics, half of them with WHO specifically this year addressing COVID issues. And so, we're, but part of being, as we prepared the platform to be ready for COVID that we didn't know was coming, um, Brother Elliot here on the phone is, issued a grand challenge last October about, hey, telehealth is one of those technologies that's been out there a long time at the Ministries of Health, with maybe the few exceptions like we heard in Paraguay and Mexico and some other places have not implemented, even though the solutions were out there. And Elliot, would you address that? So we, we've made a big difference this year and we CED would love to work with your International Society of Telemedicine. You know, once again, and we can bring in other partners that, you know, International Hospital Federation and others. So I, I still have a lot of hope, and but I, I feel your frustration, Elliot. Uh, first of all, I just acknowledge that you and Cup and I have worked together for 20 years uh, on these uh, uh, topics and issues and have met in the US and uh, Geneva and elsewhere uh, to speak to these and about these. And I think we have turned silver uh, at, at about the same rate. Um, I share all of the same frustrations uh, and many of the presenters who were excellent uh, described uh, some, some brilliant uh, progress. Uh, I, I think Martin really touch the painful point that Yunkop and I know, which there have been thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pilot studies all over the planet, and hardly any of them have uh, reached uh, even a broad, uh, a broad application or sustainability. Um, we, we are in an era where telehealth has been deployed as a, as a necessary measure using Zoom, like we're using now, using uh, dozens of other disparate communication modalities, but it's not telehealth in the sense that we have dreamed it, envisioned it, uh, where we actually get patient data, we get prescribing medication, we close all of the open gaps of healthcare uh, for everybody uh, on the planet. Um, the challenge of equity, access, uh, cost, quality uh, are the things that have turned my hair silver and my hairline uh, receding. Uh, and, and yet there's an era of digital natives, young, uh, uh, bright professionals who have new visions. And uh, I think young copy said it well, if everyone had access to all the knowledge and information that we had, this, this can catalyze solutions. So uh, we have a, 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 a big challenge. I created it or described it in uh, Rome last year as a, a grand challenge for our clinical engineering community, which is to bring together all the best practices and standards and uh, stop this nonsense of uh, Apple Watch or Fitbit or uh, which operating system, we don't care. We want connected people, physicians, caregivers, we want solutions, results uh, that are sustainable. And uh, this is the era for that to happen. This is the opportunity for that to happen. And, and this is uh, a project that uh, Pedro Galvin and I uh, took on. Many of the people who were on the, uh, as participants on this webinar uh, have, were part of the early uh, discussions early this year about creating this grand challenge activity. We got sidetracked by something called coronavirus. Um, uh, and we will return to this as soon as we can turn our attention and, and energy uh, to this because it is, a, it is a massive opportunity for all of humanity. And uh, we, we owe it to ourselves, our children, our communities uh, all around the planet to solve this. Thanks. So Judd Tender, so you guys are implementing, how'd you do that in, this, in the face of all the regulatory challenges and beyond? So the, uh, uh, in two pathways, uh, um, and, and, and I, I guess in your question, you mean uh, the challenges around uh, teleconsultation, but not teleprescription, am I right? Right, the things that UNCAP was talking about, yeah. Yeah, so uh, one is uh, at least, uh, over-the-counter drugs can be prescribed. So that was a shortcut because it's, it's the uh, non-over-the-counter drugs that can't be prescribed. And, and you can start with prescribing or allowing prescription of over-the-counter drugs. Two uh, is bringing out a tele telemedicine bill, which recently became an act, which, which allows. 
and 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 what uncap is actually saying is we discuss about the problems uh, uh, why don't we have the time to discuss about the solutions because it's actually the solutions that help and today uh, uh, you know that who has the triple billion goals and there are large number of telehealth solutions globally that have at least touched a million lives even if we were to start with those solutions that have touched or crossed a million lives we would have at least a 50 of them on the table and these are solutions that are not by fly by night operators but are scalable solutions that have sustained through the challenges so number one are documenting those telehealth solutions that have touched at least a million lives and we would know because 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 a million lives is not small or a million patient encounters is not small and these are solutions that have passed through the credibility and the test of time two the model standards for data and metadata so that systems that are evolving and have not yet adopted can have a base paper to start from because when india started the data and metadata standards everybody starts from a compilation and then you have this difficult problem of what to take and what not to take so base paper on data and metadata standards because everybody is going to hit this wall sooner or later and three every telehealth solutions comes like a happy birthday cake you put two extra cherries it becomes a different cake you put put an extra ribbon it becomes a different cake but what is what are those bare minimum uh, features demographics facilities uh, technicalities that you need in a telehealth solution because sometimes what happens is the supply factors Uh, uh tend to make better become enemy of the good and therefore uh, the, the 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 demand systems the hospitals uh, really struggle as we struggle in multiple of programs of ours to decide what is it that we can start with bare minimum because telehealth is also about growing with time and therefore if we could have these three things archiving a um, systems that have touched a million lives having a base document on what could be a reasonable data and metadata standards standards of interoperability standards of evolution and three what are those bare minimum things that every telehealth solutions can start with so that everyone can start with something and then learn from each other and grow with time i think these three things would be very encouraging endeavors towards encouraging our those brothers and sisters and those systems that have not yet started or those who have made a start but not moved forward much due to challenges cope up with the 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 emerging needs thank you jad tender uh, pedro and uh, adrian thanks uh, tom i only will to say all the people and junkap in especially that uh, we have to think how we can use as engineers as clinical engineers our knowledge to to make a creative use of all the technologies we have today in the world in this case we, we can only share our experience that we have made a revolution regarding telehealth in my country paraguay is a very little country but we use and you can say in today that all the stakeholders that means politicians at the parliament the minister of health and all the people today use telehealth and telemedicine face to face the pandemic and we save works for for the physicians who can't uh, attend the the patients because you know the of because of the isolation of the people only covid patients were admitted in the hospitals and we are now we have a telehealth law we have a, a resolution of the ministry of health where we can use all the tools approved through the ministry of health to attend all the people and to prescribe medicaments and that means that that is the the biggest uh, maybe experience we have made in the south part of south america and we can share our, our our knowledge through an alliance also 
We are there with Elliot and Tom organizing uh, telehealth webinars, and maybe we can spread this experience to all the other people who need uh, this kind of experience and to build a very strong and sustainable uh, telehealth system in the world. Thanks. Yes. Um, go ahead, Adrian, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, as engineers always want to use the newest uh, technology, but um, we have to observe legal issues, understand the point of view of the physicians and the need of the patients. And as I, uh, I always said, we have to make multidisciplinary answers. That's all, thank you. Martin, I know you want to share. Yeah, I have a lot. I don't know where to you start. Release the screen, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, so I think the, the, the big question, the big answer for me is, uh, I think something that Juncap and Elliot uh, spoke about is how do you how do you generate this innovation? Um, and I think if you look at like Star Trek, the Borg, you know, by connecting everybody together and sharing information, you can if you know all the answers, it, the solutions are easy. The challenge, and I think I've come from a, a privileged position being in telemetry in corporate, where a lot of these problems that I see have already been solved. We have vehicle tracking companies in South Africa that compete for a small market, and they have optimized the way they monitor vehicles, for example. We have delivery company, online delivery companies like Amazon, and they can move stock from one place to another for a minimal amount of money. Yet in South Africa, we can't get HIV drugs from a, a facility to a patient um, uh, at, uh, cost effectively. So I think um, instead of looking internally, we need to start looking at what has been done externally in in solving some of these problems. Uh, you know, te te telehealth for me is, is uh, you know, in incredibly similar to the how security has been done in banks, where you have video cameras and video cameras are now connected via mobile, mobile technology to centralized platforms and it's done optimally. The, the trick is trying to find those answers because they aren't published in papers because these are competitive advantages, you know, between competing companies so you need internal spies to to come out and and tell how these things have been solved and i think um that way and you know just looking at a, at a broader at a broader picture how how are queues managed in banks and in shopping centers why can't we implement queue management in in clinics for example how does google extract information out of us um so surreptitiously and so elegantly without us even knowing, yet we have to have surveys and we have to have medical doctors sitting trying to extract information out of patients. So I think there's a lot of knowledge out there that we, us as engineers, need to start bringing into this team. Um, I can carry on, but I think that's it for me. Well, folks, it's been two hours and this has been incredible. Uh, certainly the YouTube, you know, segmented are gonna come out of, of the recording from this program. We're gonna share the Q&A and some of the responses, you know, afterwards, uh, we're gonna share the chat, key parts of that. Uh, we'll share references that we haven't shared before. So thank you for your time. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. We probably will do a follow-up program. Um, we did one on regulation a couple of weeks ago and we plan to do a follow-up webinar, seeing if we learned anything, if we've implemented anything maybe in the first quarter next year, I think we'd like to do the same with this program is, uh, you know, we're going to go back and get to work and share as much as we can, but we've got to come back together and see if we're making a difference here in a few months. Also, maybe in the first quarter next year, I thank everybody for the time. Congratulations. And thanks for all the speakers. Excellent job. Unbelievable job. Congratulations, Tom, on all the speakers. Thank you thank very much. You, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, Absolutely. FMBC. Happy Happy Monday, Monday, Louise. Thanks. Bye. Well done, all. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Have a good day.